I want to talk today about a flag that is not our country's flag. It's arguably the second most famous flag in our country. It's currently on display at the U.S. Naval Academy. It's a blue flag that bears the words, don't give up the ship. And it has a really uh, powerful history behind it. Back in the War of 1812, America's second war for independence, in the U.S. Navy there was a young captain named Captain James Lawrence who was the commander of the USS Chesapeake. At one point during the War of 1812, the Chesapeake engaged the British frigate, the Shannon, and a very violent skirmish broke out with many casualties on both sides. Eventually, towards the climax of this naval engagement, the Shannon rammed into the Chesapeake, and the British sailors boarded the Chesapeake, and fierce fighting broke out on the deck of the Chesapeake. And eventually, Captain James Lawrence was mortally wounded. And as he was being carried down to where the surgeon was below deck, he was heard giving his last command to his crew, don't give up the ship, don't give up the ship. And shortly afterwards, Captain Lawrence uh, did die. The crew did surrender when there was no other alternative. But his words lived on, his crew, and indeed around the nation. His good friend, Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry, just a year later had a ship built and commissioned named the USS Lawrence. And it was commissioned to serve on Lake Erie against the British to lead the fight. And Perry actually used the Lawrence as his flagship. And he had a flag created for his flagship with the words on it, don't give up the ship. And that cry became a rallying cry for not only the US Navy, but indeed for many in the country. And that flag, which led the flagship, which led against all odds, the naval victory of the American Navy against the superior British Navy. And that flag became a national treasure. And again, today it resides at the US Naval Academy. Don't give up the ship. Today in the gospel, we're presented by the church with this gospel of when Jesus returns to his native place of Nazareth. You know, Nazareth, which at the time would have been a tiny little town with just a few hundred people in there. You know, Jesus would have no doubt been intimately known by those playful people in the place in which he was born. You know, he would have been, in the eyes of many, just one of the guys. And Jesus, when he comes there to do his Father's will, to proclaim the kingdom of God, he's met with obstinance, with resistance. You know, they want nothing to do with him. He's rejected by those in his native place. And Jesus, as he exhorts his disciples to do elsewhere in the gospel, shakes off the dust from his feet and continues carrying on the will of his Father. Even though the lack of faith in those in his native place prevented him from doing many miracles or mighty deeds there, you know, he did not falter in the slightest in carrying out his Father's will. I think about how our Lord in his sacred humanity must have been, you know, shaken to the core and, and indeed like saddened by this obstinacy of those in his native place, his rejection there. In his sacred humanity, no doubt he would have felt a desire on a purely human level to like give up his mission, to abandon, you know, hope in really anything that would have been accomplished by his preaching. Imagine the heartache of being rejected by those closest to you in your native place, you know, a place as small and intimate as Nazareth was. We read in Luke's gospel when Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God in Nazareth, the people are met they meet him with such obstinacy, such resistance, that they actually try to catch Jesus and throw him over the brow of the hill so as to dispatch him. But he slips through their midst and escapes and continues doing the Father's will without faltering. But I think about that rallying cry of Lawrence, don't give up the ship, our Lord's persistence in doing the Father's will. And really, what does that mean for us as Catholic Americans today as we celebrate the Lord's Day, uh, which today also is Independence Day? I think for us as Catholics, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, there's been a lot of times, especially in recent years, where we've had a temptation to give up the ship, you know, to surrender in particular. You know, we think about scandals that have made the news. We can think about feelings of disappointment with those even in places of authority. You know, like, and when we're met with those questions at family barbecues we may attend today, like, why do you still go to church? Why are you still living out your faith and doing this? You know, no doubt we can feel a little bit of a sadness at times or 
even begin to question ourselves and let that temptation fester within us almost like an infection. You know, why am I still living my faith out? Why have I not abandoned the ship that is the bark of Peter, which is the church? We know, though, that we're here as Catholic Christians, baptized, united by a universal call to holiness to do the Father's will in our own lives, whether that be as priests, as husbands, wives, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers. You know, we're called to live out our vocation to holiness wherever we are. And we find ourselves born, or at least come to this place, which we know as the United States, our, our nation, our nation. Pope St. John Paul the Great, in his book, Memory and Identity, which came out shortly before his death, he speaks so beautifully and eloquently and articulately about patriotism. And he would be so bold, and I would be so bold to say that in order to be Catholic, you need to be a patriot. In order to be Catholic, you need to be a patriot. You cannot be Catholic and not be a patriot. What does that mean? That word has a lot of different connotations these days, doesn't it? You know, sometimes it's thrown out as a dirty word. Sometimes it's thrown out as other things that even have political connotations. But what does it mean to be a patriot? St. John Paul II links patriotism as something that falls under the fourth commandment, the commandment that God gave us to honor our mothers and fathers. It's a commandment to receive, accept, the spiritual patrimony that comes to us through our mothers and fathers and the place in which we're born, you know, and the corresponding duty that comes along with that to pietas, to reverence that. Patriotism, he goes on to say, is how each citizen, how everyone must work for the common good of all citizens in his native land, to have an authentic love for what comes to us through our land, our, our culture, our language, our history, what unites us together. Pope St. John Paul the Great, he, he speaks about as well, what is that word patriotism? Where does it come from? You know, patriotism comes from a Latin word patria, meaning fatherland. And patria comes from another Latin word meaning pater, father. You know, to love the patria, it's an extension of our love for pater. You know, the fatherland comes to us through the father and that love we have for the patria indeed passes through the pater as well. You know, St. John Paul II, he also makes the beautiful distinction between what the state is and what the nation is. Nation comes from another Latin word, natus, meaning born. Natus, meaning born. You know, the place in which we are born. And there's a distinction between the state and the nation, between the place in which we are born and the organizing body that rules over the place in which we're born. He beautifully points out and, and makes this beautiful distinction that it's the state that grows up and arises from the nation as if it were a plant coming out of a garden. We could think of that like the garden bed of the nation from which the state comes from and grows. You know, it's no doubt then that Pope St. John Paul the Great elsewhere said that as the family goes, so goes the nation and indeed the whole world in which we live. You know. I think of all the different things in our culture, so many forces that are at work that seem to want to tear down and burn down, you know, the spiritual patrimony in which we have. And it's St. John Paul the Great who says that the nation and the family are two natural institutions that cannot be done away with and cannot be replaced at a time when such fierce warfare is being released upon the family. And then I would say an extension of that Upon the nation. You know, there's nothing that can replace that. He is so bold as to say. At a time when being a faithful mom and dad, a faithful husband and wife, a faithful citizen who knows that, like St. Paul, our true citizenship ultimately is in heaven. There's so many discouraging factors that make us sometimes want to give up the ship, you know, to abandon our mission, to uh, be derelict in our duty. To kind of just give up, you know, to find some other place to run off to. But the duty of pietas, of reverence for our nation, our authentic love for country, our authentic patriotism, you know, cannot and does not permit us to do that. You know, it's up for us, if we have the beautiful and good desire to love our nation and to work for the good of our nation, you know, our first and foremost responsibility must be to be saints 
to correspond to our call that we received at holy baptism to holiness, you know, to, to take the sacraments seriously, to make a good and regular and honest confession frequently, to come here to be fed and nourished with our Lord himself in the Eucharist, to bring our kids up in the faith and to give to them the spiritual inheritance that is our faith. And from that, we can cultivate a healthy and fertile garden bed from which those in people, those in places of authority, those who work for the state may come from. We pray for that grace to be thankful always for the many blessings we receive from our nation. You know, today in a particular way, we call to mind the rights which have been endowed on us by our Creator, which are self-evident. You know, life, which begins from conception to natural death and must be referenced at every stage in between. You know, liberty, freedom, which is not a license to do whatever one wills, but to grow in our capacity to choose the good and the pursuit of happiness, which cannot be fulfilled in passing entertainment and amusement, but is fulfilled in the author of all happiness, the one who instilled in us a natural moral compass for virtue. President John Adams said that our nation's constitution can only fulfill the needs of a people that are moral and religious. We pray for that grace that we can be a people moral and religious, a people converted to God. And from the nation in which we're born, we can cultivate that fertile garden bed from which those in our country go forth may blossom. We pray for that grace whenever we're tempted to discouragement, to despair, or to give up on all hope, you know, to never ever abandon the ship.